hello, and welcome back to Bumblebee, where today we go far out of the ways of acceptable hygienic law abiding society to expose ourselves to the unbearable living conditions of the past you wouldn't believe. Okay, so it was covered in a recent video. Number 10 will be La Riconada, aka Devil's Paradise, a 50,000 personal settlement 16,000 feet up in the Peruvian Andes, making it the most remote city in the world. The locals, to quote literally every article about this place, work themselves to death, and that's proven by the life expectancy being 30 to 35 years old. All in the namesake of illegally mining gold. The people live in squalor, tin apartments, garbage lined streets, overflowing sewers, and pollution on every surface of everything. The water used in the mining is just dumped, and all of the communities downstream, which are strictly farming areas, receive polluted water to support their livestock and crops, said Federico Chaveri, an environmental crimes prosecutor for the region. These same waters carry heavy metals directly into Lake Titicaca, aka the largest lake in South America and a vital source of drinking water and fish for the surrounding populations. These chemicals cause lung diseases and respiratory infections, which impact the nervous system causing memory loss, deformalities, paralysis, and eventually death. When police or other authorities come and try and enforce law in this ungoverned zone or restrict mining, they have been threatened. Now, the settlers and others in La de Canada say that the gold supply is running out in the area. If you want to learn more about this nightmarish place, perhaps check out my recent video, the top 10 creepiest historical locations you can visit today. And while you're at it, don't forget to subscribe to the hive. With all that Oppenheimer love going around, let's talk war grounds. Number nine is the trenches. Have you ever done a Google image search for trench foot? I feel like if you haven't, just know that that alone is grounds to get a spot on this list. And shell shock, and louse, and rats, and mustard gas, and flamethrowers, and World War One especially, no land was ever taken. It was just terribly thought out and terribly fought. The majority of young soldiers who all got excited and signed up at the beginning of the war were just volunteers who thought it would be over by Christmas. Thought they were going on an exciting, fun adventure and traveling, not living in a hellish stalemate. They had no idea what they were getting themselves into. Then think of being there on that battlefield and in those trenches. Mud, gloomy, the air is barely breathable. People all around you dying of disease. Check. Random painful death raining down from the sky. Check. Squatting in a puddle of mud and feces along with the bloated maggoty dead bodies of your comrades. Check. Being soaked to the bone for weeks and sometimes without a chance to get dry for endless periods of time. Check. And when it's finally time to try and sleep, you listen to hundreds and even thousands of soldiers in the no man's land wailing through the night as they slowly die without any chance to be saved. Yeah, check. Given the choice of enduring world war trenches or being literally anywhere else any given time of history, I would take the option. But would you still take it if it's number eight, Biafra? So Biafra was a partially recognized secessionist state in West Africa that declared independence from Nigeria and existed from 1967 to 1970. When Nigeria gained its independence from the United Kingdom on October 1st, 1960, a federal constitution divided the country into three regions. The Hausa Fulani in the north, the Yoruba in the southwest, and the Igbo in the southeast. Six years in, there was widespread outrage with the government, which had become corrupt. Then on January 15th, 1966, a military coup overthrows and kills Nigeria's first prime minister. As several of those involved were Igbo, and many of those killed were politicians from the north, it was unanimously labeled as an Igbo coup. Army Commander Major General Johnson, an Igbo person, suppressed the coup himself, but then took power. His plan to abolish the regions and establish a unitary government further compounded northern fears that the southerners would take over. A counter coup in July saw soldiers from the north seize power as General Johnson was overthrown and killed, and Colonel Yakubu Gowan came into power. Gowan's ideology to settle the constitutional future in Nigeria was abandoned after a series of group killings in October of that year. About 30,000 Igbo are victims, and about 1 million are internally displaced. Some northerners living in the Igbo areas were also killed in revenge attacks. In response, on May 30, 1967, Colonel Ojuku unilaterally declared the Independent Republic of Biafra in the southeast of the country. War almost immediately begins. Explosions, shells, weaponry of all kinds. In Nigerian history books, that period between 1966 and 1970 is rebranded as the Nigerian Civil War. But for those whose families lived through it, it is an erasure of truths not to name it the Biafran Gen word. Estimates of the death toll vary, with some putting it at more than 1 million and others more than 2 million. Some died as a result of the fighting, but most from hunger and disease after the Nigerian government imposed a land and sea blockade that resulted in mass famine. Most people starved to death. The foundations of the Nigerian government's denial were planted in January 15th of 1970 when Biafra agreed to cease fire and the world ended. A whole lot can happen in a year, or in this case, the 9th century, number 7. The 9th century was a pretty awful after King Charlemagne died. When he did, Louis the Pious became the sole emperor of much of Western Europe. When Louis the Pious dies, 
unexpectedly, crap kinda hits the fan and things start falling apart. Upon his death, his three sons disagreed over the empire and divided it up, effectively tearing it down. Europe then was so depopulated that forests regrew to cover like 75% of the continent and they were full of raving boars, wolves and bears. Medical knowledge was also at its absolute worst in this time period everywhere, so enjoy dying of rabies. Magyars raided anywhere there was open land, and Vikings raided anywhere there was water. Britain, Ireland, Scotland experienced mass settlements of Viking people in the 9th century who set up Anglo-Saxon puppet rulers in each kingdom. The Mediterranean meanwhile was harried by the Saracen pirates and Rome was literally run by gangsters. So Tang China started the century with the effective rule under Emperor Xiangchong, but ended the century with Heungchao rebellions. Meanwhile, the Maya were getting curb stomped by the unbathing European colonizers who carried more diseases than a sticky 5 year old, resulting in warfare, the abandonment of cities and the northward shift of populations. It wasn't until Pope Gregory's genius and the coronation of King Otto I did things really turn around. Since it ties in pretty well with the last point, Assyrian captives is number 6. Alright, so obviously being anyone's captive is gonna suck, but hey, there are some that are better than others. Assyrians though? They were not one of the betters. This is a society that became notorious for its vast use of torment, both physical and psychological. Anytime the Assyrians, like other kingdoms, pillaged and overtook settlements, townships, kingdoms, whatever, they took the surviving people as forced labor to be used and sold. No food, no water. You get those once someone bought you for their farmland. Until then, survive or die, bro. In the words of an early Assyrian king, I built a pillar over his gate and I flayed all of the chief men and I covered the pillar with their skins. Some I impaled upon the pillar on stakes. Many captives I burned with fire. From some I cut off their hands and their fingers. From others I cut their noses and their ears. Of many I put out the eyes. The eyes thing he mentions at the end is super prevalent. The Assyrians would actually gouge out their captive people's eyes, who were chained up 100 per line except the guy in the front. He'd keep his eyes in order to guide the line, which would sometimes have to drag the bodies of those who died along with them until they arrived at the destination. Once there, they gouge out the line leader's eyes too. Then everyone was sold to their tasks, one of the most common being walking in circles, pushing a grindstone until you die. History can be in the making. Number five will be a modern day mess. In order for us to have the technology we overindulge in and now blatantly expect, people are suffering horrific work and living conditions in Congo mining for Colbert. It powers most electronic gadgets, including smartphones, laptops, and electronic vehicles. Colbert batteries are seen as a greener alternative and are preferred by the big brands like Apple and Samsung. Well, the folks manually mining it for us are doing it with no industrial tools, no protective clothing, no hard hats, not even face masks to shield from toxic dust, let alone shoes sometimes. A representative of Amnesty International said people are working in subhuman, grinding, degrading conditions. They use pickaxes, shovels, stretches of rebar to hack and scrouge the earth in trenches and pits and tunnel to gather colbit and feed it up the formal supply chain. And they're barely being paid enough to survive, sometimes as low as a dollar a day. A significant portion of colbit from the DRC is sold to Chinese traders and smelters who are often more concerned about the price than the ethics. They work in wretched conditions that are extremely dangerous to their help as being exposed to cobalt dust can cause fatal hard metal lung disease. Work hours are long and miners labor in tunnels that are not properly supported. Rainfall can cause large areas of the mines to suddenly collapse as proven by 80 miners deaths between September 2014 and December 2015 alone. Living conditions for them and their families are harsh as they have no electricity or running water. Millions of trees have been cut down and the air around the mines is hazy with dust and grit and the water has been contaminated with toxic effluents from the mining process. At the present there's no regulation directly covering the global coal but market, let alone the local practices in DRC. Number 4 is a terrible time for 1800s China. Also known as the century of humiliation, this terrible time in China really cemented around 1839 when the Qing dynasty lost the poppy powder wars to the Brits who had been literally forcing the addictive substance on the country until China tried to ban it. When they did, they smuggled it through India and it incited war between the countries. One of two that would happen because of poppy powder. China is forced to admit defeat and sign very unequal treaties and reparations to Britain in the form of Hong Kong. The Taiping Rebellion was a massive civil war in southern China from 1850 to 1864 against the ruling Manchu Qing dynasty. At least 20 million people died, many civilians, in one of the deadliest military conflicts in history. During this, in 1855, a form of bubonic plague begins in the Yunnan province and spreads rapidly, killing approximately 12 million people between China and India. The northern Chinese famine of 1876 
1976 to 1879 then begins. 9 to 13 million people are estimated to have died out of a total of 5 provinces populated with 108 million. There's also the Boxer Rebellion between 1899 and 1901. It was an anti-foreign, anti-Christian uprising that wrought the killing of 32,000 Chinese Christians. The Qing Dynasty falls in 1912 from civil war and another one followed but World War II came around, stopped the war, both sides worked together to fight and then the atrocities like the incident in Nanjing completely rattled the nation. Once World War II is over it's not long until civil war returned to the country thanks to its new power hungry ruler. After four years of fighting was over, the republic had fled and the country was reunified. Back to the DRC we go, number three is about Congo under Leopold II, which was a horrific nightmare to put it plainly because rich people shouldn't be able to just buy and privately own a whole ass region, but that's what the Belgian King Leopold II did on February 5th of 1885. He established the very ironically named Congo Free State, having brutally seized the land as his personal possession. Using his own fortune but also money loaned to him by the Belgian government, the king's goal was to bring civilization to the savage people of Congo, and like most people who say that, he became infamous for being evil. The people of Congo are forced into laboring for valuable resources like rubber and ivory to personally enrich Leopold. There are strict quotas on how much of these resources they had to collect, and by strict I mean that Belgians cut the hands off of everyone in the family whose father didn't meet that quota. Estimates vary, but about half the Congolese population died from punishments or malnutrition. Many more suffered from disease and torment. Among those who weren't killed, many were punished by having a hand, foot, ears, nose amputated. Several Congolese rebellions were mercilessly put down under Leopold's direction, but eventually they stopped going unnoticed by Europeans and American nations who finally protested and demanded Leopold end the human rights violations in his free state. In 1908, international pressure forced the king to turn the Congo Free State over to the country of Belgium until the Democratic Republic of Congo gained its independence in 1960. Number two is a reminder that money can make us do horrible things, the sack of Antwerp. On September 1st of 1575, Spain was officially bankrupt. The government of King Philip II had huge debts from the many battles the Spanish Empire had as part of the notorious 80 year war. Bankers refused to perform transactions asked of them by the King of Spain. This forced Philip to forego the money order and actually physically ship the soldiers paychecks by sea. Unfortunately, the 400,000 florins worth of pay intended for the troops is seized by the government of Elizabeth I when the ship sought shelter from a storm in English ports. By this time, some of the soldiers stationed in the Netherlands had not received pay in two years. They were on enemy lands and they were angry. November 4th of 1576, Spanish soldiers sanctioned in the Belgian city of Antwerp rose up, led by Sancho de Avila, and laid waste to the historic area. Whether rich or poor, nobody was safe as homes were invaded, women were violated, men were killed, and property and money stolen. In all, it's believed as many as 7,000 people died, thrown into canals, or simply chopped down by swords. 600 homes burnt that night, and the so-called sack of Antwerp was to have a far wider impact. The events led to a European-wide economic crisis. Antwerp was a major trading power now wiped off the map. According to Brown University professor Harold Cook, 1576 was a truly terrible year, as it also marked the rise of the Holy League in the neighboring France. Combined, this condemned much of Europe to a period of poverty, uncertainty, and widespread violence. And of course, it's number one, the Great Famine. The Great Famine that ravaged Russia in 1921 and early 1922 was one of the worst human disasters of the 20th century, having been born from a cocktail of chaos, the Russian Revolution, the Russian Civil War, and the government policy of unanimous sharing. The consensus among historians is that at least 5 million Russians died of starvation and disease, but it could be as many as 8 million. Bolshevik policies only exasperated the disaster as most peasants prepared for crop failures by storing grain in reserve, but the Russian granaries were empty thanks to low yields and the government taking it all for mass distribution. As famine worsened, thousands of Russian peasants fled the countryside into the cities, sometimes leaving entire families of corpses behind, hoping for better access to food. There was nothing. Those who survived lived off of literally whatever they could find. Seeds, acorns, grass, weeds, tree bark, and even the corpses of dead animals. In 1921, when foreign aid finally arrived, a new problem came to light. People eating. Sometimes folks didn't even wait until their comrade died on their own, but sped up the process a little just to have something slash someone to put in their stomach. This led to the illegal trade of, well let's just say large portions of nondescript meat appeared on the markets in Russian towns and cities for sale. The very late involvement of American Relief Administration helped ease the crisis. ARA employed 300 Americans and more than 120,000 Russians imported over a million tons of grain and fed in excess 10 million people per day. American relief efforts in Russia were never 
formally accepted or acknowledged by the Bolsheviks. Lenin was so angry on needing the aid that he had approved the ARA involvement through an intermediary. By 1923, the drought had broken, seeds and grain had been imported by the ARA, and the Bolsheviks had relaxed requisitioning by introducing the new economic policy. Alrighty, thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed. Be sure to like and subscribe if you want to see more from us. And until next time, what living condition do you find most unbearable?